rebel. I'll break. Oh wait, that's not right. In my Code Veronica retrospective video, I brought up how Capcom had about five RE games in development all at the same time in the late 90s. All of these projects were overseen by the man responsible for kicking off the series in the first place, Shinji Mikami. Instead of directing these games, he had other talented developers take the reins for him while he was working on something else. That's right, Mikami was overseeing five RE games while producing and directing another game. This project was similar to Resident Evil in its gameplay and ambitious nature, a title that would take inspiration from films like Alien and Jurassic Park, while using some of Resident Evil's very iconic survival horror gameplay mechanics. This project was Dino Crisis. After the recent success of RE2, Mikami wanted to move away from zombies for a while. He wanted to make a horror game that was based more on real-world science. At the start of development, Mikami thought, hey, dinosaurs are big and scary and known to have been extremely violent. Why don't we make the dino enemies of this game bigger than the player, smarter than the average zombie, and able to follow the main character almost anywhere within the game world? This new brand of horror was dubbed Panic Horror. The main difference from RE's survival horror was the more consistent fear the dev team was aiming for over the slower pace of Resident Evil scares. Along with this new vision of instilling panic in the player, the devs also wanted to push the envelope graphically for Dino Crisis. This title uses its own unique 3D graphics engine, and the first thing the devs wanted to accomplish was creating a fully 3D world instead of using pre-rendered backgrounds like in their previous survival horror games. In the beginning, Dino Crisis was to be set in an open jungle environment, and if you know anything about the PS1, you'd know that this idea probably wasn't going to work. And that's precisely what happened. The devs had a lot of trouble getting their jungle to work with the PS1's hardware and polygon limitations. This forced Mikami to take a step back and to rethink Dino Crisis' setting. Looking back on Resident Evil, Mikami found that one of the major things that made RE games so scary and effective was their narrow and overall claustrophobic environments. Setting the game in an abandoned research facility overrun by dinosaurs was very appealing to the dev team. This gave them another chance to have the game world make sense and to retain the visual quality they were going for initially. With the environmental problem somewhat solved, the team then focused their efforts on creating high-quality dinosaur enemies for the player to deal with. For the enemy design, Mikami and his team really wanted to nail down the perfect dinosaur enemies. This proved to be very difficult for a plethora of reasons. One of those being, it's kinda hard to recreate something that's long been extinct accurately. The team ended up taking reference from other carnivorous animals that are still around today. Things like lions and tigers were the main inspiration for DC's prehistoric monsters, due to their violent predatory nature and not being afraid of humans. At the end of the day, Mikami wasn't completely satisfied with the dinosaurs in this game. He wanted each individual enemy to remember the player's actions and to use that data to follow and potentially ambush them. Obviously, something like this is super ambitious, and what we ended up getting were creatures that all had a preset personality, like in most video games. There was also difficulty adding dinosaurs with specific bone structures, resulting in most of the enemies having a similar gameplay feel to one another. Dino Crisis was revealed at TGS 99 and would release two months before Resident Evil 3. What we got out of Dino Crisis was the best the team can make at this time, and it's safe to say that almost every aspect of this game's development was incredibly challenging to figure out. I personally think the final release version of this title is still very ambitious and partially accomplishes a lot of its original goals. So with our history lesson out of the way, let's go a little further back in time and talk all about Dino Crisis. Dino Crisis begins with you getting an email from an undercover agent currently stationed in a facility on a remote island. This agent has discovered a secret project helmed by a world-renowned scientist named Dr. Edward Kirk. The thing about this doctor is that he's been dead for the past three years. He's also connected to some pretty controversial stuff, so whatever he's working on now probably isn't going to be good. After receiving this email, a special forces group comprised of three highly skilled operatives are sent to this island to extract Kirk and find out what he's been working on. You play as Special Agent Regina, accompanied by her two comrades, Rick and Gale. Upon arriving at the facility, your two buddies decide to split up. 
Gail goes to check if any guards are wandering around the facility, and Rick heads inside to take over the security rooms. Talking to Gail, we find him investigating some suspicious pools of blood and ripped up scenery. This was definitely not man-made. After finding a key to the backup generator room, we get a call from Rick inside. Rick informs us that the facility is deserted and the power has been cut. Perfect timing for us to find that generator key. Together, Gail and Regina head over to the generator room, but not before stumbling into a disturbing discovery. That's disgusting. This guy's been eviscerated. Something tore his intestines straight out. Look at those tooth marks. It had to be some sort of animal. Okay, let's move on. After heading inside and restoring the facility's power, we hear gunshots and screaming outside. Exiting the generator room, we hear some creepy growling noises and find that one of the fences has been ripped open. Gail is nowhere to be found. I hope this is not Gail's blood. Following the fresh trail of blood, Regina is jumped by a velociraptor. Doing the only thing that we can right now, we run back to the guard post. The raptor follows us and jumps over the fence, letting us know that these guys aren't going to give up easily. After stepping through another gate, the raptor just sort of stares at Regina before slamming into the gate and running off. These dinosaurs seem really smart. Good news! I got the control system back online. What's the situation over there? It's Gale. I lost him. <laughs> so what's the bad news? Did you run into some guards? You're not gonna believe this. He was attacked by some kind of dinosaur. <laughs> now that's a good one. So, who was it? Arnie? This isn't a joke, you idiot. We were just attacked by a big-ass lizard. For real? What's going on over there? Uh, all right. Head over to the control room and we'll sort out this whole situation. After filling Rick in on the situation, we take our first step inside the facility. Like Rick said earlier, this place is super abandoned, but knowing there are dinosaurs on the loose, we have to keep our guard up. Climbing up into a ventilation shaft and exploring further, we find the control room where Rick is waiting. Rick is doubtful about all of this dinosaur talk. I guess he didn't see any dinos on the way in. I think he's just happy that Gale is missing. Rick lets Regina know that this place's security system is complicated. He won't be able to power up all of the areas yet from this one station. After this, Regina heads out. What follows is familiar survival horror gameplay, finding items, dodging past enemies, and solving puzzles. And that's actually where I'm going to cut the story recap, because Dino Crisis is a very short game, and I don't want to get too spoilery with this video. This game's story is simple but effective. Dino Crisis is about 6-8 to eight hours in length, just like Capcom's other horror games. Overall, I'd say that the story is pretty good. It's very Resident Evil, except instead of starting in a relatively normal-looking location and then finding a robust laboratory, in DC you're basically in and out of labs for the majority of the game. The story definitely goes places, and there is actually a very nice sci-fi twist when you figure out why the dinosaurs are in the modern day. I think it's both fun and explained well. The problem I have with the story is that while this game is really fun, there aren't many, how do I put this, hype moments. In RE1 all the way up to Code Veronica, it felt like there was something really big happening almost every 10 minutes. Meeting a new monster, figuring out a cool puzzle, or just throwing down in an amazing boss fight. Those types of things don't happen too often in Dino Crisis. There's only one boss, the T-Rex, and it only shows up a couple of times. I know the devs wanted to make each enemy encounter feel like an over-the-top, persistent threat, but that idea comes with some small negatives that I'll talk about later with the enemy design. My favorite part of DC's story is its characters. Regina, our main, is awesome. Like, you thought Claire Redfield was sassy? Regina is sassiness personified. She also doesn't take anyone's BS. Gail! <clears throat> Thanks. That G.I. joke deserved it. She's amazing. I like how she just calls Rick an idiot for not believing her about seeing a dinosaur. It's kind of rude, but also the perfect reaction. This isn't a joke, you idiot. We were just attacked by a big-ass lizard. I'm just gonna say it, Regina is definitely in the top five of survival horror women. Her design is both cool and visually appealing, and her personality is sassy and no-nonsense in all the right ways. Hmm, I might have to make a video ranking all of the survival horror girls. Nevertheless, Regina is amazing. 
The tech expert of the group, Rick, is also good. He helps you with opening a lot of areas as you progress, and he actually follows you into new parts of the facility and takes control of each security system. I really like this because oftentimes in movies and other fiction, secret giant structures like this usually only have like one security station for all of its power. In DC, it's much more realistic with multiple rooms that monitor each part of the facility. Rick is also really fabulous. And I'll just say that much about his character. When you find the undercover agent, Tom, Rick is like super into protecting him. It's pretty cute. It's also heartbreaking when Tom dies. Rick is so down about it. I think this game was a little ahead of its time. Poor Rick. Squad leader Gale starts off as a hard-headed jerk that you kind of want to see die, to being a hard-headed jerk that you want to save. Well, I did at least. When I first played this game back in the day, I was sure that Gale was going to fill in the Wesker role for this title the squad leader that constantly disappears, shows up randomly, and ends up betraying you. Well, minor spoilers, it turns out Gale just really wants to complete his mission. While the place is falling apart around him, he's still going after Dr. Kirk, even when severely wounded and not in his right mind. Gale is great, and so are the other main characters. Everyone here is well voice acted too, and the writing is really good. In my opinion, the character writing feels better than some of the Resident Evil games. The last thing to talk about with the story is this game's branching path system. At multiple points in DC, you'll have to choose to side with either Gale or Rick. These choices dictate which path you go down for the rest of the story, leading to different endings. I always try to go for the true canonical ending. And here's a hint for that, always side with Rick. On Rick's path, the game throws more difficult puzzles at you, but you'll feel a great sense of accomplishment upon completing and seeing the story play out in the way it was meant to. Also, don't don't worry about betraying Gale, because he ends up coming with you anyway. So yeah, Dino Crisis has some good replay value with its branching paths, multiple endings, and fun unlockable costumes and infinite ammo weapons. There is something pretty crappy that hinders DC's replayability, and that's not having the ability to skip the in-game cutscenes. It felt a lot like playing the PS1 version of RE1 again. You just have to sit through the cutscenes every time you play. At least in this title's case, you have good writing and voice acting, so that's a huge plus this game has over RE1. I know Mikami-san called this game panic horror, but I'll be honest with you guys, Dino Crisis is survival horror as it gets. It might even be the purest form of survival horror. Dino Crisis plays very similarly, if not the same, to Resident Evil, using fixed camera angles and tank controls. Like I mentioned earlier, the game is fully 3D, so no pre-rendered backgrounds. But like in Code Veronica, Dino Crisis features many areas where the camera moves around, tracking the player's movement and creating a very cinematic feel. The moving camera is used a lot more in this title than it is in CV, and I really like it. It's awesome running down a long hallway, seeing the camera track Regina's movement the entire time. In a few situations, it can feel like you're being watched by an off-screen predator. It adds to the game's atmosphere a lot. Regina's movement is responsive and tight, and she has the ability to 180 quick turn like Jill did in RE3, this time with a single press of the R2 button. Regina does have a very specific ability that no RE characters had up to this point, that being the ability to aim your gun and move at the same time. That's right, holding R1 and pressing up or down on the D-pad moves Regina while aiming. You still can't shoot while moving, but being able to reposition while locked onto a dino during combat does a lot to make this game not only feel unique, but it adds to the challenge Dino Crisis is going for. Quick thinking and moving to a better position can mean the difference between life and death. Also, Regina just looks really cool walking down a hallway with her gun at the ready. It makes you feel like you're playing as someone who knows how to handle a gun very well. It's an animation detail that is very much appreciated. There is a downside to aiming while moving, though, and that's the potential for a dinosaur to tail whip Regina's gun out of her hand. You heard that right. You can drop your gun or get disarmed during a fight. Once disarmed, Regina enters a defensive stance. Your gun will have an arrow pointed over it, and running next to your lost gun will automatically retrieve it. There is a moment in the game where this happens in a cutscene, but this can also happen while fighting any standard raptor enemy. It's such a great mechanic for a horror game. Like, you have one line of defense. Imagine losing that during a fight. It's terrifying when it first happens. You gotta run and grab your gun before whatever creature bites your head off. It's so cool. Another new mechanic is DC's Danger Events. These events take place during specific cutscenes and act a lot like quick time events, 
from modern video games. When you see the word danger flashing on the screen, just mash the D-pad and the circle and X buttons to complete the sequence. There aren't many of these throughout the game, and I feel that they're spaced out pretty well. Some of them will kill you, but as long as you press the buttons I mentioned before, you'll complete them with relative ease. Just like in the RE games, in Dino Crisis you can combine items. The difference here is that combining, or in this game's case, mixing, is its own fleshed out mechanic. So in Resident Evil, very specific items were combinable to create more powerful versions of themselves, like a red and green herb mix to give you a full heal. In DC, multiple different healing items can be mixed together to create stronger versions of said item, or create radically different items that can sometimes give you special healing properties, like curing blood loss for example, this game's version of the poison status. You'll also be finding items that can multiply existing things in your inventory, giving you more of a certain quantity of something. Combining anesthetic liquids together can make powerful trank darts that down enemies with a single shot, and you can also increase the potency of these darts with intensifiers. That also goes for making stronger heals too. The mixing system is really deep and fun to experiment with, and it offers some added strategy when replaying the game. By the way, you will also just find a lot of the items that I described without needing to mix them. DC's answer to Resident Evil's universal item box is the multicolored emergency plug boxes. Scattered throughout the game are different types of item boxes that can only be opened with a certain amount of plugs you'll be finding in the facility. These different boxes contain items depending on their color. Green boxes give you healing items, red gives you ammo, and yellows give you both healing and ammo. If you open two green boxes in different parts of the facility, you'll be able to access the contents of those boxes at whatever other green box you happen to find. The same goes for the other colors too. In that way, the plug boxes function exactly the same as RE's universal item boxes. I know it sounds complicated, but it's literally the same thing as RE, just split up between three different colors. The final unique mechanic Dino Crisis brings to the table are the resuscitation items you can find and craft. This feature is actually kind of strange for a survival horror game, but it makes sense and I'll tell you why in one second. So resuscitations are basically lives. If you have these items in your inventory and you die, you magically come back to life. You'll respawn one room back with all of your items and HP intact. The only reason I think Dino Crisis has a lives system is that the enemies in this game are really difficult. So yeah, let's finally talk about those enemies. There are six different dinosaurs you'll be facing off against in this title. Raptors, Pteranodons, uh, these little guys, Therizinosauruses, a blue raptor type, and last but not least, the massive and terrifying T-Rex. The standard raptor enemies move faster and have way more HP than Resident Evil's hunter enemy. So imagine that for a second. The basic enemy in this game, that you encounter frequently and right out of the gate, is way stronger than the mid-game enemies of Resident Evil. It's freaking crazy. Raptors can claw at you from a neutral position, grab you with a powerful bite, pin you to the ground, and attack while moving. If it wasn't obvious, this game's raptors are extremely formidable. They are probably the most challenging basic enemy in any survival horror game. It also doesn't help that your starting pistol barely leaves a scratch on one of these guys. You'll quickly find that running away is your best option. Also, you won't be finding ammo lying around as you would in an RE game. You need plugs to open those boxes we talked about earlier to find a good supply of ammo. While I think avoiding all enemy encounters is the way to go, running out of a room isn't always a get out of jail free card. Pretty much every time you leave a dino encounter, that dinosaur will follow you into the next room. If you decide to throw down with one and end up killing it, even that is only a temporary solution because Dino Crisis features respawning enemies. So even if you take one of these monsters down, they'll be back in no time. It's very intense and definitely where Mikami's vision for panic horror comes into play. These creatures will not leave you alone. They will hunt you down and make you feel like their prey. One cool thing that you can do to combat these persistent monsters is to activate defense grids found in a lot of the game's hallways. So when running away, you can trigger these grids that will spawn a wall of lasers, restricting dinos to certain areas. This is awesome for a lot of reasons, but the main one for me is that you feel like you're creating your own defense route through the facility as you explore. Another thing to keep in mind is that you can keep these grids up and still travel to blocked off areas using the many ventilation shafts found in certain hallways. Vent shafts often have multiple exits, so it really makes you feel like a rat trapped in a deadly maze. Trying to survive these almost bulletproof monsters as you make your way around and solve puzzles is freaking awesome. I think the dinos overall are amazingly well implemented in this game. My only complaints, and this goes back to what I said at the start, there aren't enough dinosaur types to be encountered in this title. Everyone here is basically raptor type, and the one flying enemy only shows up a handful of times, much like the crows from Resident Evil, only gigantic and they can pick you up. 
There sadly aren't any four-legged types to be found here either. There's only one boss in this game too, and that's the T-Rex, which like I said earlier, only shows up a few times and is defeated by a few shotgun rounds and scripted set pieces. These are minor complaints admittedly, but it would have been nice to see a little more variety in these guys' designs and maybe a few other boss encounters. The last notable gameplay element are the puzzles. Again, much like RE, Dino Crisis features a lot of puzzles that you have to complete to progress the game. I think the puzzles in Dino Crisis are way more difficult and varied than the ones found in Resident Evil. There's a lot more thinking and putting things together with DC's puzzles. There are just so many more variables to take into account when doing them. The DDK lock system comes to mind in that regard. This door locking system requires you to find two key items and then figure out a password to the locked door by deciphering a jumble of letters or some sometimes numbers. Hmm, that usually works for me. At a certain point, you get a fingerprint scanner where you have to go around the facility scanning the fingerprints of dead bodies, then figuring out their ID numbers just to go through certain doors. It's really cool, but kind of complicated. A lot of the puzzles in general require you to gather two things before doing the actual puzzle part. There are also just some puzzles that are kind of difficult for the sake of being difficult. Like this one, the solution is flashed on screen for a second, forcing you to remember each letter in the sequence, and it just keeps getting crazier as you go. It feels like the devs wanted this game to be puzzle heavy to stand apart from RE, but I honestly think some of the puzzles drag the game down a bit in the pacing department. The pipe puzzle is one that I always dread. This one might take you a while. I never remember how to do a lot of these puzzles after not playing for a while. I guess that speaks to the quality of the memorability of some of them. Overall, I really enjoy Dino Crisis. It feels more like a puzzle game than any of the Resident Evils that came before it. The focus on running from danger is actually really refreshing compared to RE. And I think DC brings a lot of really unique gameplay systems to the genre that we hadn't really seen before. The pacing does drag a little bit while doing some of the endgame puzzles, and Dino Encounters can feel a little samey after a while, but overall the gameplay was really fun and kept me on edge every step of the way. I know there's been a lot of comparison to RE in this video, and that's just because both games play very similarly and have a lot of the same mechanics. I know people that consider DC a pseudo-sequel or side game to the Resident Evil series, and yeah, I can kind of agree with that. It's definitely a spiritual sequel in its gameplay, at least. The graphics in this game are good. I think they've aged well and border on a realistic and stylized look. The character models, Regina in particular, are very anime looking. Regina's striking red hair and bodysuit make this game feel like you're playing a weird Japanese version of like one of those Jurassic Park spin-off games from the 90s. The dinos, while not completely accurate with what we know today, look great and animate very well. This game is probably one of the best looking games on the PS1. The way the camera dynamically moves through the environment without sacrificing any detail is very impressive. The environments themselves look great too. They have a lot of density and clutter to make them feel realistic, which is rare for a fully 3D game like this. It's one of the main reasons why RE used pre-rendered backgrounds. The only downside to the locales in this game is that they're all basically facility rooms. You're getting a lot of grays out of the game's color palette. But there are a couple of outside areas, but you don't go too far from the facility, sadly. I would have loved to explore the neighboring jungle on the island, but as I said at the start, an accurate looking jungle was basically impossible to make on the PS1. Besides DC's visuals, its music is great too. Most of the tracks are just atmospheric, but there are a couple of very memorable tracks, like the intro music and the save room theme. The atmospheric tracks do a really great job at building tension while exploring. The main facility theme got under my skin a few times, making me think there was going to be a dino right around the corner when there wasn't. One negative about Dino Crisis's sound is it's not so good audio mixing, so I'm not completely sure what the story behind this is, but all of the dinosaur noises and musical tracks are pumped up to 11, while character voices are at like 5 on the volume scale. In a lot of cutscenes, it's extremely hard to make out what the characters are saying because the music is blasting over everything. It also doesn't help that this game is lacking any subtitle options, so some cutscenes I just couldn't hear what anyone was saying. Thankfully, the most important cutscenes seem to have gotten some proper mixing, so you won't be missing out on any key information. I honestly believe that the devs did this on purpose, so you'd be like, what'd they say? Then turn your TV's volume up, only to catch a heart attack moments later when a T-Rex comes roaring in your face as one of the loudest things on the planet. It's pretty messed up, but I think it was intentional just to scare the player. When Dino Crisis released, a lot of critics and game review outlets called the title Resident Evil, but with dinosaurs. That might sound negative, like saying this is basically a copy of another game with a different creature, but that actually helped DC out a lot in the sales department. With the raging success of RE2 just a year prior and the upcoming RE3 slated to release the same year as Dino Crisis, 
Fans of Capcom games and survival horror had a lot to look forward to and knew exactly what they were getting out of Dino Crisis based on those reviews. The Japanese release of Dino Crisis sold over 300,000 copies in its first few days and would go on to selling over 2.5 million copies worldwide. The game also got good reviews overall and is considered a platinum seller by Capcom. The game's dev team even went on to form Capcom Production Studio 4 because of the success of Dino Crisis. An entire studio was born out of this game. Obviously, with DC's worldwide sales, it got a sequel almost immediately. A sequel that we will talk about some other time. Can't wait for that. I love Dino Crisis. The gameplay and story complement each other perfectly, as a true survival horror game should, and the constant threat of being eaten by a prehistoric monster was refreshing and, and provided the healthiest challenge to survival horror fans. The game isn't perfect, the audio mixing is honestly bad in a lot of cases, and the puzzles can bog down the experience a bit, but overall this game has a ton of charm. The devs did their best with this title, and I think they succeeded. I know Mikami-san wasn't very pleased with how the visuals and some of the gameplay mechanics came out, but honestly, the success of Dino Crisis is what matters the most. This game still has a very strong fan community to this day, and after replaying it two times for this video, I just want to send a personal message to Mikami-san. You guys did a fantastic job, and I hope you all know that now. I would love a Dino Crisis remake in the style of RE2 2019. I feel like a Dino Crisis remake can not only bring the series back, but I bet it would do as well as its original counterpart did all those years ago, but that's only a distant dream for now. At least a give us a standard re-release, Capcom. If you want to play Dino Crisis, the game is available for dirt cheap on the PSN store via the PS3. And you could probably find a physical copy for PS1 for around 60-ish dollars, or maybe even more. Check out your local game stores and flea markets, it's bound to show up there. Capcom Production Studio 4 made something truly awesome, and no matter how hard it was to put together, and how difficult it can be to play sometimes, it's safe to say that in its development, Dino Crisis stands as one of gaming's ultimate challenges. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I'm so glad we finally talked about this game. I love Dino Crisis, and it was probably the most requested retrospective from you guys, so I hope I did a good job. The reason this video took so long to make was because I had to rewrite a lot of it halfway through my first draft because nothing felt right as I was writing it, and that was a huge bummer. But yeah, we're here now, and I thank you all for getting to this point. Before we end today's video, I just want to thank a couple of people for helping me make this video as good as it can be. First up, Manuel Perez. Manuel made the absolutely amazing 3D renders of Regina, Rick, and Gale that you see on screen now, and the recreation of the original cover art for the PS1 version of this game. It looks so amazing seeing photorealistic versions of these characters, and it definitely doesn't help the pain that we will probably never get an RE Engine Dino Crisis remake. <laughs> In any event, I just want to thank Manuel, you did such a great job. Next up is my buddy Mono Memory. If you guys don't know him, you should. Mono has made some amazing remixes of classic RE music in a synth-pop style. He also made a few tracks for this here video, and they all sounded great. So yes, thank you Mono. You also did a fine job. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Jaw Muncher. Jaw Muncher was a great help in providing me with documents and probably the only dev video for Dino Crisis in existence. I really appreciate the help, and I cannot thank you enough, Mr. Munchie. All of these amazing people's links will be down in the description. Be sure to check them all out. Anyway, if you guys like this video, please consider subscribing and checking out my Patreon. You can support this channel for as little as $1 per month, but if you pledge $5, you gain access to video previews and my exclusive Patreon series called Inside the Sphere. There are currently 10 episodes of ITS on my Patreon. The show is a solo podcast type show where I talk gaming news and what I've been up to. Please check it out if you want to support the channel in a big way. Everyone who's already supporting me there, I love you all very much. You are one of the best groups of people I've ever dealt with on the internet, and you're all beautiful. That marks the end of this episode. I hope you guys have a great day and I'll be seeing you all in my next video. Later!